so it is Thursday, January 12th, 2023. It is 7.33 p.m. Well, good evening. My name is Christian Klein, and I am the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I'm calling this meeting of the board to order, and I ask all attendees who are not recognized to speak to please mute, net, mute their connection until such time as they're recognized by the chair. Uh, I would first like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Sorry, I followed your directions to mute. <laughs> Not a problem. Uh, Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Uh, Venkat Holly. Here. And Elaine Hoffman. Here. Thank you all. Uh, participating on behalf of the town, uh, we have Rick Valarelli, our administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Rick. And assisting as well as uh, Vincent Lee. Here. Good to have you with us. Um, I don't think there's anyone else here on behalf of the town. Um, to the consultants uh, for the board, uh, Paul Haverty from BBH Law, who is our um, Mass Housing Partnership Technical Consultant. He has a meeting that started another meeting that started at seven, so he'll be joining us as soon as he's available this evening. Um, but we have with us on um, Sean Reardon from Tetra Tech. Good to have him with us. Here. Um, and I don't believe Mr. Bomer is joining us tonight. I think he's coming in two weeks. He's our architectural consultant. Um, appearing on behalf of the applicant, uh, Paul Feldman. Here. Well, good to have you. And Matthew Majuri. Here. Good evening. Good evening. And Matt, if I could ask you to introduce uh, the other members of your team. Sure. Uh, so uh, also from the Majuri companies is Paul Majuri, our CEO, uh, Jackie Majuri, our director of uh, real estate and marketing. Uh, we have uh, Michael Novak, um, who's our civil engineer from Patriot Engineering. Um, we have um, Rich Kirby from LEC Environmental, who's our uh, environmental and wetland consultant. And I think that covers everybody on our end at the moment. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. This open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely, consistent with an act relative to extending certain state of emergency accommodations signed into law on July 16th, 2022. This act includes an extension until March 31st of 2023 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Public bodies may continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the public body physically present at a meeting location, so long as they provide adequate alternative access to remote meetings. Public bodies may meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recordings. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on excuse me, on this meeting's agenda or on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda and as chair reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. Um, so I'd like to start with just quickly with a couple of administrative items um, on behalf of the board. So the First should be item two on our agenda this evening, which is the approval of the minutes of our December 19, 2022 meeting. Um, these are minutes that were uh, prepared by Mr. Valarelli and Vincent, Mr. Lee and sent around to the board for comment and the revised version posted 
uh, back to the board. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the written minutes for December 19th? Seeing none, um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes from December 19th, 2022? Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second. second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So vote of the board to approve the minutes. Uh, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Um, excuse me, uh, Ms. Hoffman? Lost her connection for a moment. Uh, Mr. Holly? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Aye. Chair, both aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item three on our agenda, which is the approval of the written minutes from December 20th. Um, again, these are minutes that were prepared by Mr. <coughs> excuse me, Valorelli and Mr. Lee and brought forward to the board for comments and reissued. Are there any further questions on the minutes for December 20th? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So moved. Thank you so very moved. much. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board to approve the minutes from December 20th, 2022. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to item four on our agenda. Motion to approve the written decision for 201 Old Spring Street. Uh, this was a uh, decision that was jointly written by myself and Mr. Hanlon presented to the board for questions and comments. Um, and the final version posted again this afternoon. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the decision for 201 Old Spring Street? No. Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve? Mr. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second. Uh, thank you, Mr. DuPont. The vote of the board to approve the written decision for 201 Old Spring Street. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is approved. Thank you all very much for that. That brings us up to item number five, which is the <clears throat> main item for this evening. No, it looks like Mr. Haverty will be joining us momentarily. So we are now turning to the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook to be located at 1021, 1025 Massachusetts Avenue. This evening, the board is continuing the comprehensive permit hearing for the residences at Millbrook, the redevelopment of an existing site in the neighborhood office B1 district. The submitted documents are available from the board's website or as an attachment to the posted agenda. We open this evening with a few words about the comprehensive permit process as it differs significantly from other public project review procedures. The applicants will then be invited <clears throat> to introduce themselves. The applicant's wetland specialist will speak to comments received from the town of the board's consultant, followed by um, their uh, stormwater consultant. The board will then present questions to the applicant regarding those issues before we open the hearing for public comment and questions on the same topics. The applicants, um, the board has scheduled several hearings for this project. This schedule is available on the project website under the ZBA page on the town's website. The board will vote to continue this hearing at the end and adjourn for the evening. So the comprehensive permit law, so this also known as 40B, was established by the state in 1969 to allow developers devoting a certain percentage of the units of a development to being affordable, the developer could receive an expedited review whereby the Zoning Board of Appeals would hear the application and be authorized to grant waivers from any local statute which it finds can be granted without negatively impacting the health, safety, and welfare of the local resident. The applicant cannot request waivers from any state laws and regulations, which must remain in full effect. When the board is preparing its decision, it has three options. It may approve the project as submitted, it may approve the project with conditions, and it may deny the project. At this time, the town does not meet any of the criteria which would allow a decision of the board to avoid appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee. The state committee is empowered to increase the amount of affordable housing, and they rarely sustain the denial of a comprehensive permit. The board is limited to conditions which could be applied to similar proposed developments pursued through regular zoning, and the board cannot reduce the number of overall units unless it can demonstrate the necessity to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the residents 
and the board cannot increase the percentage of affordable units or the affordability of said units, only the subsidizing agency may do so. So at this point, I would like to again reintroduce attorney Paul Feldman from Davis Mom D'Augustine to uh, introduce the members of the project team who will be presenting this evening. And then um, if you could also let me know if there are is somebody who would like to be screen sharing, I can set that up for them. So Mr. Feldman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, members of the zoning board. Uh, my name is Paul Feldman. I'm an attorney in Boston. I represent the applicant. Um, as the chair mentioned, this is a continuation of a public hearing that commenced, if I recall correctly, um, in uh, October of 2022. Um, at that first public hearing, um, the applicant uh, presented a PowerPoint presentation where we uh, presented the project plans that have been submitted to the zoning board and, and that are uh, posted on the uh, board's website uh, for this project. Um, one of the items uh, addressed at the very initial public hearing was the zoning board's desire to uh, retain uh, review consultants to evaluate certain components of our submission. Uh, one, review uh, one review consultant uh, was going to focus on uh, uh, traffic and um, uh, civil engineering type matters, and uh, a second review consultant was retained uh, to um, uh, comment on uh, the architectural design of the project. Um, um, the uh, zoning board successfully retained third party review consultants, and uh, last week we received um, some initial uh, comments um, from the review consultants. Um, we set up uh, a, a series of meetings with the zoning board that uh, <clears throat> starts tonight and will take place um, over the next uh, few weeks in which uh, we go through subject matters uh, that the board wants us to address and, and we answer any questions that, uh, that may come up in the public hearing process. What we explained to the chair for tonight uh, was that we wanted to uh, spend the time tonight focused on um, initially a discussion of um, some review comments. We, uh, I should have mentioned, we also received review comments from Arlington town boards and departments um, in addition to the third party review comments. Um, we uh, we mentioned to the chair that for tonight's meeting, as you just heard, we wanted to focus briefly on um, some uh, comments we received from the Conservation Commission, and we're going to start with those and with our consultant, and then move into um, our civil engineer um, um, uh, discussing the the uh, third party review comments that uh, were received in connection uh, from the third party reviewer. Mr. Reardon. Um, with regard to civil, uh, our focus tonight is going to be stormwater management. Uh, we plan to present a traffic impact assessment and go through traffic comments, uh, as well as um, um, uh, address comments of uh, the third party review uh, architectural designer uh, at subsequent meetings um, 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 uh, after tonight. Uh, so with that as sort of uh, making the table as to where we find ourselves, let me turn to the um, uh, uh, wetlands issues on this site. Um, as we noted at our original public hearing, um, there is a portion of the property uh, that is within the jurisdiction and resources of the Arlington Conservation Commission. Uh, the predominant uh, wetland resource area is um, uh, riverfront, and it is the uh, outer boundary, the 100 to 200 uh, foot area uh, outside or from the river bank, from the Millbrook Bank. Um, we will be obligated to obtain a order of conditions under the wetlands, the State Wetlands Protection Act from the Conservation Commission. That's not something that can be accomplished through the comprehensive permit process. Um, that will be a separate filing with the Conservation Commission. 
in connection with the comprehensive permit, uh, the zoning board um, is um, um, responsible for issuing a permit under the Arlington Wetlands Bylaw, which is typically administered by the Conservation Commission, but in the context of a 40B comprehensive permit, it is part of this expedited one-stop shopping uh, that uh, 40B provides. So it would be a permit that is issued uh, by the zoning board. Uh, one of the things the applicant has requested in, and we are um, uh, working through with uh, the town is an opportunity to commence the notice of intent filing for an order of conditions under the State Wetlands Protection Act um, while the comprehensive permit uh, process is going on so that the Conservation Commission can be engaged in reviewing the drawings under the Wetlands Protection Act and there can be uh, coordination between the Zoning Board and the Conservation Commission in connection with um, wetland issues that are within the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Uh, one of the things we um, are committed to do uh, if we can get a notice of intent filing uh, uh, to proceed is we will work with the Conservation Commission to extend any time periods for them, for the Conservation Commission to render a decision under the Wetlands Protection Act until after the proceedings in front of the Zoning Board are fully completed so that the uh, final version of plans that Wetlands is, um, uh, the Conservation Commission is reviewing will conform to what it is that the ZBA uh, has reviewed. Um, so with that sort of procedural uh, point uh, aside, I want to turn it over to Rich Kirby, who is a wetland scientist with LEC Environmental. And Rich will uh, speak generally to the um, um, uh, approach uh, in addressing um, uh, the wetland resource area known as Riverfront and uh, responding to uh, some of the comments that the Conservation Commission submitted in a letter uh, which we received. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. All right, uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I'm Rich Kirby from LEC Environmental Consultants, and uh, we've been working with the Maggiores on this project since its inception last year. And um, as part or in support of the comprehensive permit application, uh, we prepared the bylaw notice of intent application, uh, which has been reviewed by the uh, Arlington Conservation Commission and, of course, the peer reviewer. Uh, we did have a chance to take a look at those comments, and we'll be submitting a revised bylaw notice of intent application that addresses those comments. But I just wanted to go uh, through some of them. Um, but before I do that, as the uh, from from a from a Wetlands Protection Act and Arlington Wetlands Bylaw perspective, the primary resource area on the property is the riverfront, and most of the property, uh, or uh, sorry, the northern roughly half of the property is within the outer 200 foot riverfront area. So it's within the riverfront area that extends from 100 feet from Millbrook to 200 feet from Millbrook. There's a small section along the northern uh, property boundary that's within the 100 foot uh, riverfront area. Um, but the work proposed there is, is mostly uh, is, is really all mitigation, uh, a portion of the uh, walking trail uh, that Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture had, had, had designed um, as part of the mitigation area is within that uh, first 100 feet. We'll be revising the plan to pull that out. So. Uh, the only work that will be within the first hundred feet will be the uh, will be the mitigation, which is uh, I'll get to in a minute. Um, but with regard to riverfront area, really it is a, a redevelopment of uh, of the degraded riverfront area on the site, and of course, in order to fit the project uh, onto the riverfront area and the site, a portion of the riverfront area that is naturally vegetated will be altered. Um, that is primarily for the installation of the stormwater management um, basin behind or north of the proposed structure and a retaining wall. We're also proposing um, to remove many of the invasive exotic trees and understory plantings along with the debris 
and trash and fill material that has accumulated within the wooded portion of the property uh, over the years and uh, start anew with uh, a native landscape plan, along with some site grading to create some uh, some visual interest and some uh, stormwater uh, attenuation. And that's all outlined in the uh, in the application that we that we prepared. Uh, the 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 footprint of the um, uh, of course we're gonna we're gonna create sort of a, a a forested woodland within the northern portion of the property that's currently forested now, albeit with the invasive exotic plants. Um, and the footprint of the stormwater management basin will, will have a uh, we're proposing a uh, a meadow above that that will function um, as a pollinator meadow, and that'll be mowed once annually in the fall. So we'll have some grasses and things, wildflowers, et cetera, growing in there to provide a little bit of uh, habitat diversity. Um, would, would it be easier, would, would, would the um, board prefer that I share some plans to sort of illustrate what I'm talking about? Yes, let me go ahead and... I, I have the plans as well, ready to share if, if you can authorize uh, me to share whatever, whatever works for uh, for everybody's fine with me. I was trying to find your name in the list. Ah, there you are. All right, let me pull up my uh, okay, so you should be plans. Now. Okay, let's uh, let's share the screen here. So um, I was going through the plans before the um, before the project, uh, or rather before this hearing. So this plan here uh, shows the existing conditions. Of course, the two commercial structures with the uh, the parking, the paved parking areas in the back, um, the northern portion. This is the portion I was talking about, which is currently wooded. You have the Millbrook condominiums. Oh, sorry about that. The Millbrook Condominiums parking lot is back here, and that's what separates this site from Millbrook, which is delineated with these uh, high water mark flags here, uh, one through eleven. So these high water mark flags place the one hundred foot riverfront area boundary, which is this dotted line here, and the two hundred foot riverfront area boundary. So you can see uh, most of the riverfront area on the site is comprised of this um, wooded area, which again, we included some photographs. There's lots of uh, trash and debris. The vast majority of these trees are invasive um, uh, Norway maple. And what we're proposing, of course, is to remove uh, many of those trees that are within the riverfront. And do a little bit of regrading and, and create sort of a uh, an urban um, woodland environment comprised of many native plants. And we have a couple of walkways proposed to uh, provide a you know sort of a, a place for the residents to walk, uh, perhaps a place to sit, and uh, etc. This is the this blue rectangle is the stormwater infiltration system, and then of course we have this retaining wall here that I'm sure the board is familiar with. And this area up gradient will be the uh, uh, meadow environment. We're going to see this with some meadow grasses. There'll be signage and, and instruction in the o and plan to mow this once annually in the fall uh, outside the growing season. That'll help keep out the woody invasive plants but and also promote seed dispersal and establishment and maintenance of that uh, meadow environment. The... Um, I'm going to share, well, so that, well, that, that basically covers the, uh, the proposed work within the riverfront area. And we outline the regulatory compliance for the Wetlands Protection Act, which is effectively the same as the, uh, as the bylaw. There's really no additional bylaw requirements for work in the riverfront area. I will mention, however, that the bylaw does include um, land within 100 feet um, is considered an, an upland resource area, an adjacent upland resource area. And you can see from this plan here, this is the 100 foot riverfront area. 
and you can see how it extends along the uh, you know northern portions of the northern property boundary. And we are doing work in that zone, but that work is really limited to the mitigation that we're proposing. Um, the removal of the invasive plants, the removal of the debris and uh, fill, reestablishing a native soil profile, replanting with uh, with the native plants. So, so all of that work is within the um, with all of that work within the upland uh, resource area, the adjacent upland resource area, or the aura as it's referred to, uh, is is part of the mitigation. So none of the project work is in that zone. That's all within the outer portion. Uh, as we described. So the we, we did receive some comments and like I indicated earlier, we're going to be submitting a revised bylaw notice of intent, which addresses many of those comments and we'll find a way to uh, highlight or otherwise uh, indicate the changes so you don't have to read through the entire document again, although you'd be welcome to. Um, there were a couple of uh, discrepancies in the number of trees that are going to be removed. Uh, within the upland resource area, within the riverfront uh, for the project. And then, of course, we have additional tree removal within the mitigation area, again, because they're the, the vast majority of them are that invasive Norway maple. And if we're trying to establish a native plant community, which is going to thrive and provide much improved uh, habitat in the long run, then uh, we feel that, though, that that's that's the way to go for this area here. Um, I went over the work in the uh, 100 foot uh, resource area. We'll quantify that and clarify that in the in the notice of intent application. Um, there was a question about the quantity and size of, of the trees proposed. And um, Kyle Zick of Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture uh, put together a planting plan and I believe this was included in the zoning and the comprehensive permit application. We did not include it as an appendix to our bylaw notice of intent, nor did we include the site plans, only because we thought it might be a little redundant since those were be being included under separate cover uh, with the comp permit application. But this is the uh, this is the planting table that's included on sheet five of Kyle Zick's plan set. And it does overview the, the quantity of the deciduous trees that are gonna be proposed, as well as, uh, as, well as the size. Uh, some of the sizes are in height. For example, the amelanchier is proposed at a 12 foot height. The paper birch is proposed at a 12 foot height. Other plants are, are sized uh, in accordance with caliper. So for example, the swamp white oak is a two inch caliper, um, et cetera. So if, if the commission would like, uh, or the board would like us to sort of requantify these in, in terms of height, I think we could work with Kyle to estimate that. And that might give a apples to apples comparison of what's being removed versus what's being proposed. But the point here and the idea um, behind Kyle's plan is to not just establish and plant sapling trees that are all the same size and same age, but to have a diversity of sizes and ages. So that way, as the woodland matures, you'll have um, younger trees and older trees that mimic a more natural uh, woodland environment instead of a more um, instead of an environment that's a little bit more uh, oh, what's the word um, artificial, perhaps. We're also proposing a number of seedlings, uh, and again, to that end of having a um, a forest of, of different ages, we have some seedlings proposed. Uh, yeah, many shrubs, many native shrubs, and then uh, we also have some seed mixtures and ferns that we're uh, going to be proposing in that area as well. So we can we can again include this table in the revised bylaw notice of intent to show how those proposed trees, saplings, shrubs, and ground cover plants uh, are quantified. There was also a recommendation to incorporate an invasive species management plan. While a big effort will be made up front to remove many of the invasive plants, the Norway maple, uh, the, the buckthorn, et cetera, that's, that's present, and we'll be removing a lot of the debris and the topsoil that contains the rootstock and the seed bank of those invasive plants and putting back uh, a natural um, soil profile with new topsoil. Uh, there's always the chance and, and likelihood that you're going to have invasive plants either colonizing 
or leftover seed and or rootstock that will germinate and, and propagate within the restoration area. So we will be putting together an invasive species management plan for incorporation into the application. Uh, we can include it in the operation and maintenance plan for the site. And that would be something I presume that we would be implemented by the uh, by the condo association in perpetuity, as has been requested by the uh, um, Arlington Conservation Commission for oversight and management of this restoration area uh, in perpetuity. Um, you know, the last item had to do with the um, the Millbrook Condo Association to the north and their property to the north. Um, if we recall here, let me zoom to a plan that shows it. Oh, there, there we go. So this, uh, this the Millbrook, as is delineated here, there's not a whole lot of detail on this plan, but there is a zone of um, natural vegetation within adjacent to the brook that separates the brook from the parking area and paved access drives that occur between our site uh, or the subject property and, uh, and the Millbrook. So one of our thoughts in terms of a mitigation strategy would be to perhaps manage invasive plants and revegetate the land between the brook and the pavement edge on the condo property. So we've been, uh, the Maggiores have been working with the Millbrook Condom Condominium As Association to work together to, so where we can present our plan of revegetation and invasive species management. Uh, they could accept it and some formal real estate pathway could be implemented for us to actually do that work. And that would provide a great improvement uh, for the riverfront area because we would be improving the land uh, immediately adjacent to the brook. Um, all land within 200 feet of the brook is presumed to provide, uh, is presumed to be significant to the protection of the brook, but obviously the closer you are, uh, the more bang for your buck, if you will, with respect to invasive species management and revegetation. So I, I think that covers um, certainly the points that, that I uh, reviewed with the, with the town conservation commission. I, I saw that, um, the conservation uh, vice chair is on tonight. I don't know if um, if the conservation commission members wanted to wanted to talk about anything, but um, I think that's where we're at. So, one, could I add one um, piece to that update about Millbrook? Sure. Oh, thanks. Please, thanks, Maggiore. So, uh, good evening, Matthew Maggiore. Um, I'm president of the Maggiore Companies. Um, we have uh, approval. Where the vo the board for the Millbrook Condominium Association voted to approve our conceptual planting program um, along Millbrook, uh, pending their review and approval of an access agreement. So we are in the process of preparing that agreement um, so that we can prove obviously, you know, what we're gonna do there, how we're gonna get access, um, provide insurance indemnification and things of that nature. So um, it's, it's, it's moving in a positive direction on that front. Thank you. That's great news. <laughs> So I, that, that, that's the, the bulk of my, uh, my presentation, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if you wanted had any questions or if you wanted to open up to the board or perhaps let um, Chuck Tyrone, I believe, who's the Conservation Commission Vice Chair is on the line. Uh, perhaps he has something to add. I, I turn it back to you. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I would note that uh, Susan Chapman, who's the Chair of the Conservation Commission has joined us as well. Oh, great. Um, so uh, Ms. Chapnick, if I could, um, ask you to uh, address the, the comments we've received and um, let us know a little bit about what the Conservation Commission's concerns are. Sure. Um, thank you very much, um, Rich, for your um, thorough um, understanding of the changes that you're proposing. And we're looking forward to seeing those um, changes in um, updated package. Um, just a few, a few comments. You did address, um, we do have an aura. The aura is the upland uh, resource of uh, 100 feet from Millbrook. There is only a small portion of the site that is in the aura, um, though the main part of the aura is actually in the condo association's um, purview. 
And so we, we had strongly recommended that you work with the condo association. So we're very pleased to hear that that is um, happening. And it sounds like it's something that actually um, could be put in as a special condition because you've gotten far enough in discussions with the condo association. I think that um, based on what you said, um, I'll speak as the chair, but you know we'd have to talk about it in the commission. We would recommend to the ZBA that that would be a special condition because that would help mitigate, help offset the um, impacts that are happening in Riverfront and Aura by improving the habitat closest to Millbrook, which is the most important. The 200 feet is, is important, but closest to the resource area it actually is the most important. So we're very encouraged to hear that you've, you've had um, these positive talks with the Condo Association. I will say I'm also encouraged to hear that the work in the aura now is just mitigation. Um, and uh, we were looking for that. Um, and that um, the you are going to clarify the number of trees. There was a discrepancy with how many trees in what area. So we look forward to seeing that and understanding that fully, um, which trees are being removed and what trees are being proposed. Um, so I won't comment further on that without seeing it. Uh, the, we did have a comment on stormwater, but I, I'll, I'll wait for that until somebody's discussing stormwater, um, the actual management unit. Uh, we do um, find it acceptable to put a meadow above the stormwater unit. I think that that's important to have different and diverse habitats um, for our wetland resource areas. So having a pollinator habitat um, associated with the urban forest could be really positive. There's been a lot of research lately on the um, importance of even small isolated urban forests. Um, it, there was a, actually a recent, recent article, I, I cut it out in the Boston Globe in December on tiny urban woodlands and biodiversity. So um, we are pleased that this very degraded, non-native um, forested area that that's that's really actually has a lot of debris and invasives and vines in it and is not very productive as a, a habitat or as a resource. It doesn't have the resource values we would like to see near Millbrook. We're very encouraged that that can be improved. One thing we did request, and this is probably more rich to the Maggiores than to you, is that this urban forest potentially have some um, availability to the public. So we see it as, as an amenity to um, people who might be living in this um, complex. Um, and of course, any fences or anything we would have to condition to put, you know, some room for wildlife. So of course it would be a habitat and wildlife. We also would like to see it as, as a place that the community might be able to enjoy and sit quietly and contemplate in this new area that's being created. Um, I would like to ask um, Chuck Taroni if he's on. He is my vice chair and he, I always, he's my go-to for um, riverfront area standards under the Wetland Protection Act to make sure that, that he's comfortable or if he has any comments that he wanted to make tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapnick. Uh, Mr. Taroni, please. Mr. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think that Susan summed it up quite nicely. I wanna say, Rick, I appreciate your presentation. It seems like you took our comments to heart and have really worked hard. Uh, you and the, and the developers have, um, you know, essentially put together, uh, you know, something that uh, is really gonna look, it's really gonna look nice out there. I am especially excited about the fact that you got the apartments to um, start to work with you on that area close to the riverfront. I think that's going to make a big difference in the future and um, maybe we can get some more areas. So I won't talk too long. I think Susan covered it all 
I look forward to hearing you at our conservation meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Troni. Ms. Chapman, did you have anything further? I, I did have a comment on stormwater, but are you going to cover that separately? We will come back to that. Chair? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thank Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Hanlon. Um, we have a note from that said the people may be stuck in the waiting room and that may already have been fixed, but if not, it would be a good time as we switch to a different speaker to uh, bring people in. Yeah. I, I had... Um... I had checked just a minute ago, and I see again there is there's nobody in the waiting room at this time. Great, thank you. Thank Paul, you, do, Paul. Do we want to act, address the public access? Yeah, I was going to mention that of all the comments that uh, Ms. Chapnick made, we were um, um, we have discussed um, you know whether or not this uh, urban park, this tiny urban park, would be uh, something that could be open to the public and. And we think that is a request that is going to be very difficult for us to meet. Um, the uh, there are <clears throat> liability issues. I don't have to tell tell uh, generally people here, but you know this is private property. It's going to be owned by a condominium association. Uh, they're going to want to regulate <clears throat> the people that access the private property, um, and. Um, uh, there are viability issues and they're just general privacy issues that are going to be important. So uh, before uh, we, we, we create an expectation that that is going to be an accomplishable um, um, uh, outcome from that particular request, we, we, we just want the Conservation Commission to appreciate that's, that's going to be very uh, challenging and, and probably undoable. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kirby, did you have anything further? Uh, I don't. I think I covered uh, all of the comments that we've received thus far, but I'm certainly available to answer any questions or discuss things further. Okay, thank um, you. Mr. Chairman. Um, um, Mr. Moore, if I could, um, are you speaking to address as uh, the tree committee? Yes. If you are the representative of the tree committee, then yes, Mr. Moore. Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Steve Moore, uh, Newmont Street. Um, I, I want to uh, applaud the uh, planning and work that's gone into this thus far. I mean, there's significant thought being given to trees and landscape planning and, uh, and sensitivity to various issues that the uh, Conservation Committee has, uh, has brought up. I, I am going to take a little bit of a different tact than this chapter, though. Um, I, I'm, I, we hear quite regularly that uh, Norway maples are invasive and unwanted. And it is true that they're not native plants. However, they provide uh, significant tree cover to the back end of this property. I believe you said it was the north side, I think. It is. And yes, it's invasive. No, it is not a, a bad plant to have. It's not preferable, but it provides good shade and tree cover. And although it's full of as you say, debris and such, it, it provides what habitat there is in the area currently. I, I do understand that, that the plans will improve on that area. Uh, however, a very significant number of trees in, in are being taken down as, as this project, and, and you stated. Um, and I'm not sure that the plans that we've seen to date um, sufficiently mitigate. I know that they provide significant mitigation, I'm not sure it's enough, um, just because uh, this is one of the you know, sort of few small hidden areas in Arlington that, that have a natural urban forest on it already. Now, it's not the best forest. It's not definitely not in the best shape, I agree. But it, it is what we have. And we need to very carefully look at the mitigation plan to replace what is definitely going to be taken. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, if I could ask um, uh, Sean Reardon, who's the, the board's um, engineering consultant, um, if there are any uh, review comments he would like to um, address at this time. Sure. Again, my name is Sean Reardon I'm with Tetra Tech. We're the consultant for the ZBA on the wetlands issues, as well as traffic, um, civil, and, and some of the other related matters. Um, to reiterate everybody's point, I think great plan by 
Rich Kirby, and I think it's well thought. Uh, in particular, the prospect of improving the area along Mill Brook is is super valuable in large part because it also, um, right now there's very little stormwater management on the adjacent parking lot. So that would do a, a lot to mitigate not only this project, but any impacts that are currently occurring on the adjacent parking lot. So you know, that's something that I hope we don't ever lose focus on because that's gonna return a, a great deal of value. Um, one quick comment. So you know, a lot of the stormwater management is intertwined with um, these filings. So you know, rather than maybe revise the document right now, Rich, um, maybe let's get through the comments and on the stormwater first. And then when we've got sort of good control over all those issues, then we can sort of wrap them up into one revised filing. Um, you know, I know I know there aren't that many issues from a from a sort of a wetland standpoint, but the stormwater is kind of intertwined, and that may take us some time to work through some of those details. Um, just as sort of evidence of the value of that open area, I mean, I I visited once and I, I saw two turkeys, I saw a red tail hawk. Um, I was pretty shocked with the turkeys; that freaked me out a little bit, but. <laughs> Um, yeah, I was, I was I was pretty amazed at it. So it, it's a pretty cool space and it looks like it's going to stay that way, which is good. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we also are probably going to need to consider going forward is I know that there's a lot of emphasis on the wetlands, but I think in talking with the architectural consultant, there, there might be an opportunity to balance a little bit more of the sort of the the open space needs of, a, of the residents. So if there's a, if there's room for a play set or something like that, what I would just say is you, there might be a, a desire on his side to sort of balance some of these, these, um, these positive benefits. Um, and then just, you know, finally, the, the, the last thing is, I mean, this is going to be a tough site to, to construct. Um, not a whole lot of open area, not a whole lot of opportunity to mitigate runoff during construction. So the erosion control during construction is going to be hugely important. And right now it's it's a little weak right now. So I think what I'd really like to see is a little bit more emphasis put on um, sort of explaining how we're going to manage construction and how specifically runoff from the site is going to you know be kept on site and in, in the space that you have with, with what little space you have that's um, available. So you know, let's not lose sight of the fact that we've We've got to build a big project, and one of the biggest parts of the of the Wetlands Protection Act and the local stormwater um, bylaw is to make sure you're protecting the resource areas during construction. I think there's got to be a a little bit more thought put into that plan. But aside from that, I mean, traditionally we're usually discussing about the delineation of wetland boundaries. In this case, it's pretty explicit. You know, it's well defined. We don't have any any issues with their delineation or the rep representation of the different resource areas. So. Um, we're really just about, you know, how, how do we deal with these final issues? Great, thank you. Are there, um, before we switch over and talk a little bit more thoroughly about um, the stormwater, as, as Mr. Rudin sort of alluded that these two topics are, are really very intertwined, are there any specific questions from the uh, members of the zoning board at this time, which they would like to address? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? Um, one of the things that comes up in the comments at various points is a conviction on the part of both of our, uh, at least as I read it, a conviction on, on the part of both uh, of our consultants that uh, there may, in order to, because the, the site is as tight as it is for as far as construction is concerned, uh, that construction acts, activities will both require pretty much removal of all the trees in the in the northern part of the site. And, uh, and 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 it may include construction equipment and so forth uh, being stored there or used there as part of the overall project. And there's been a lot of emphasis that the northern part, the part that's in the one, the uh, ARA, is uh, uh, not going to have any permanent improvements on it that that uh, might be deleterious. But uh, I'm wondering whether that's equally true of what will happen. Uh, uh, during during construction and whether it will be necessary essentially both to remove trees but also the various impacts that construction activities themselves have uh, on that portion of the site. I wonder if that can be addressed. Uh, Mr. Measure, uh, Matt, Measure, uh, would you be able to address that? We don't have any intentions of removing any trees as it relates to construction um, or staging of equipment, nor do we intend to be 
uh, within the first 100 feet um, other than to complete mitigation. Okay, thank you. Okay. And Hamlin, anything further? Yeah, I would just, uh, let me just make one point. Um, I think we will, uh, we will plan to address in a more complete way um, the construction phasing plan and how construction will be accomplished. We know that was part of uh, Tetra Tech's review comments. It was uh, one of the um, um, uh, subject matters that um, uh, Tetra Tech wants uh, some more meat on the bone. Uh, we're going to provide that. It's, that's not something we're prepared to, to do tonight because we're working on the um, construction plan and the phasing plan and exactly how it gets uh, accomplished. But although, you know, we talk about the site as being tight and we appreciate that, um, you know, the, the ability to construct these, these types of projects in the subject property uh, is something that we're quite confident we're going to be able to put together a construction plan that's going to make sense to everyone and, uh, and to Tetra Tech. Well, we do have um, a cleaned up version of our draft, which we could certainly pop up at the end of Mike's presentation um, if we have time. Yeah, so, okay, that's fine. If we were uh, ready to sort of begin to describe an outline of uh, mm -hmm. uh, construction phasing and process, um, there, there, there is uh, thought has already been given to how you would get this project built, and everybody's familiar with you know. And when you ever you walk around the downtown of a city, and we marvel at how they they build these buildings. Well, <laughs> you know? Mr. Feldman, uh, why don't we why don't we hold off talking talking about the construction phasing until we have the the actual plans for us to review? Very good. Um, which I think will be a, a topic for a, a future a future meeting. Are there any further quest questions or comments from members of the Board of Appeals at this time in regards to what Mr. we- Mr. Chair, could I ask one just quick question? Mr. Reardon. Yes, so one of the other things to keep in mind is that when you when you change the grade around existing trees, um, you know that, that can have a, a ex extremely detrimental effect on them. And it looks like there's quite a bit of grading proposed within that tree area. So I was just wondering if Rich could sort of comment on what his thoughts are regarding the proposed regrading and the survivability of those trees. Certainly sure. If, if I could share my screen again, I want to still have get, permission. Yeah. I, I uh, thank you. I just want to get back here to the, uh, to uh, Kyle Zix. Chair, could I piggyback on that question? I think it'll be helpful to, it's sort of the same thing. Um, Certainly. Um, we talked a lot about the Norway maples, but I'm wondering in that area of trees that may or may not be protected, are there other species that are not um, not invasive? Um, maybe we could look at that in the plan. Right. Thank you. Sure. So um, as part of this effort, we did not go in and identify uh, every single tree. Uh, the vast majority are Norway maple. There are several other trees. I know there's a, a large, um, I think it might be a, a linden tree, a, a English linden tree or something like that, toward the back of the parking lot of, of the structure to the, uh, to the east. But um, this, this is the proposed planting plan. You can see this is where the stormwater management system and pollinator meadow are being proposed. This is the proposed um, stone pathway just to provide uh, residents access to it. Um, and all of these circles that you see are trees and shrubs that are being proposed. So there will be very few, if any, um, trees that will remain uh, with between the grading and just the, the <clears throat> intent to rid the site of the Norway maple to start anew with a more diverse plant community, uh, which I think will pay off in the long run. I think in, in, in you know, 15, 20 years, this site will have a very uh, diverse plant community that's providing a lot, a much better habitat than it currently does. And it will be continuing uh, to sequest more and more carbon uh, as, it, as it gets older. The other thing is, you know, when you go out there, there's a lot of canopy, there is, and there's a lot of ground cover with the vines. Um, but there's not a whole lot of understory. You know, the, the shrub layer in this area uh, is not very diverse or um, dense. 
it's very sparse. And I think that's in part due to the significant shading that the Nori maple are providing. Um, so opening this up a little bit and having the canopy species, uh, the, the replacement trees installed is going to allow much more sunlight penetration, which is, which is going to uh, foster that understory plant community. And as the forest uh, that we're proposing grows, all of those shrubs that are beneath it and the understory plantings will be well established and therefore will thrive within that native uh, canopy compared to the Norway maple canopy that's there presently. So um, I, I hope that answers your question, but let me know if you want to talk through anything further. All right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So um, with regard to the planting area, and I know that Mr. Kirby had commented and said that uh, they were going to implement the oversight and management by the con condo association in perpetuity. So I assume that that involves the entire rear area where there's meadow as well as trees. Then um, when um, Mr. Uh, Matt Maggiore commented about the conversations they'd had with the uh, Millbrook Condo Association with regard to doing the work on the other side of the parking lot, I was wondering what the plan or the thinking was with regard to that restoration on that side, whether that would be in perpetuity and who would be responsible for that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm not sure we've taken the thought that far. Um, we can certainly think about that and talk with the Millbrook Condo Association to see if perhaps some sort of um, easement or other mechanism could be provided where we could have uh, annual access for maintenance, maintenance and management of that area along the brook um, to, to be determined, but, but great question and something we'll have to look into. But at least the thinking is that there would be a perpetual um, oversight and management of that by someone. Yes, that's that's the intent. That's correct. With between the invasive species management and also the um, management and maintenance of the plantings as they're installed, the annual mowing in the fall of this meadow. Um, those are things that, in order for this area to th to thrive and do well and provide the function and value that is intended. Um, I think we'll need that annual maintenance and presumably reporting to the Conservation Commission. Uh, and, and and again, not to not to belabor the point, but that would include the other side of the parking lot. We, we don't know that for sure yet. It sounds like uh, Matt Mangiori has uh, has a good start in communicating with the Millbrook condos in terms of getting access uh, for the maintenance and management. Um, Matt, I don't know if your conversations were that detailed in terms of ongoing maintenance and management, if that could be an annual access, uh, or if that's yet to be, that level of detail is yet to be discussed. I, I, I have to go back through my correspondence with them to see what we offered. Um, and something uh, reminds me that it was possibly two years of, the first two years of maintenance would be on us before we to pass the torch to the association, but um, I will certainly make the point to follow up on that um, and respond back to the board. Thank you. Um, Ms. Chapnick has her hand up on behalf of the Conservation Commission. Um, thank you very much, um, Chair Klein. Uh, I just wanted to make one point about the Norway maples. Um, I do agree um, that they serve some habitat value at this point. I mean, just because something is invasive doesn't mean it doesn't serve a habitat value. Um, however, um, based on my walkthrough of the site, a lot of the Norway maples are around the same size or they're saplings. And if they're around the same size, they're around the same age and they're gonna fail at the same time. Norway maples are notorious for not standing up well to hurricanes and severe weather, which of course we all know with climate change, we're getting more of. And so it's kind of problematic in the town of Arlington that we have these little Norway maple pockets of forests. We have one on Summer Street um, that are gonna all fail at the same time. And that's gonna be within the next 20 to 30 years. So if we want to take this opportunity to create something 
that is going to have value to the habitat, to the wetlands, and also be resilient to climate change, it's not keeping this kind of degraded Norway maple forest. So I just wanted to throw that out there for people who may not understand that. Yes, it is serving some habitat value now, but it's not a climate resilient strategy. So. Thank you, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions from the board? Mr. Chair. Mr. Cardelli. Uh, just to maybe keep uh, on the same uh, note about the, the tree cover uh, in the back of the site. I think it was mentioned earlier um, when we were speaking that I think there's a um, landscape plan, the L1 plan, that seems to indicate that some of those trees are maintained. Uh, that planting plan that we were just looking at uh, with Mr. Kirby uh, shows all new plantings in there. So I'd just love to know um, in this next round of conversation uh, specifically if any of them are saved. Uh, and I think just in general, um, my concern is if we remove all of those trees, which certainly uh, we understand are invasive, uh, some of them are 30 inch caliper trees and we'll get the plan now. And the, the proposed uh, plans are for, you know, two and four inch caliper trees. And it just seems like, um, you know, there's, there's a loss of high canopy tree, tree cover, and uh, I know we are looking 20 years down the road, but um, for day one, uh, I, I'm kind of concerned that you do lose a little bit of resilience and uh, richness to the urban environment and all that stuff. So. Thank you for that. Anything else on the board? If not, um, I was going to go back to um, Mr. Feldman to introduce the uh, stormwater consultant uh, for the project and to have them um, present their, their stormwater comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mike Novak is our civil engineer. Uh, Mike has uh, uh, designed the uh, civil engineering components of the site, um, the stormwater management being a, uh, a key um, um, civil design element. Um, and uh, uh, I'll let Mike, uh, um, Mike has already presented in a generic way the stormwater management approach, but I'll let him uh, speak to it again in the context of the comments he heard from Mr. Reardon so we can engage in, in uh, uh, advancing the ball on stormwater management. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Mr. Novak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Mr. Chair, would I be able to share my screen to have a visual aid? Yes, give me one second. Thank you. Here. And while you do that, yeah. uh, Mike, for the record, Mike Novak from Patriot Engineering. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll get everybody uh, up to speed in regards to the plans that, that Mr. Reardon has seen and commented on and the, and the general approach approach that we took to, to start with. And then I'll get into some, some of the high level um, responses or plans that we're going to change in terms of addressing his comments. So that's what I'll, I'll aim to do. And uh, right. you should be all set. Thank you. Uh, give me one second. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. And is that okay for everyone? Yep. All right, so um, you've already seen these plans before, um, already tonight, so I'll just quickly go through um, and get everyone again on the same page. As Rich mentioned, here's the existing site as it stands now, the two uh, dwellings up at the front with associated parking uh, and the, the wetland area, uh, river front and back uh, or to the rear. Uh, some of the things I want to point out is that from this, uh, this is a surveyed uh, existing conditions plan. So this is this is a current up to date plan. Uh, I use this to establish the existing uh, stormwater mitigation design, uh, uh, modeling the existing buildings, the existing parking, and then of course using the topography uh, obtained from the survey. In a general sense, this there's a there's a small high point at the at the front of of the dwellings and then the majority of the site then runs back at varying slopes, essentially back to front. Uh, and then of course, ending up across the Millbrook parking area and into the river. Well, that's the general sense as we talked about the tree, the tree canopy in the, in the rear here. And of course it's opened through these parking areas for anyone who hasn't been at the site. So we used, I used this, to model the existing conditions to establish the, the runoff, uh, the stormwater runoff that happens today based on the 
the stormwater requirements, mainly through uh, Mass DEP and, of course, the Arlington Conservation Commission and their associated rainstorm events. And then, as you've seen, um, this is the proposed plan. So, of course, this is overlaid under the, the existing plan. Again, orientation-wise, the two existing dwellings here, parking. And you can see that the building extends past that. So the building is the yellow, uh, the yellow rectangle on the plan. And of course, you can see that the building itself takes up a majority of the site now. Um, so the first, the first uh, approach for the stormwater mitigation was to capture all of the roof area, uh, so there'd be no runoff from that area. And that is the uh, that is channeled to this underground infiltration system. Right now, this is comprised of uh, ADS storage chambers. Those are uh, a very common and typical thing that I've used and, and are used throughout most design projects in and around this area. Um, this has designed to capture this, this entire area and store and infiltrate uh, the amount of water needed to have this proposed site not increase any runoff pre, uh, in, in the post conditions, excuse me, compared to, as I spoke of, the, addition, the existing conditions numbers that were established. With taking the majority of the roof uh, or, the, or all of the roof building, you can see that the, that's the majority of the site. So the, the remainder of the site was graded to run off in, this, in a similar pattern as it, as it does now. Um, and with the balancing of, excuse me, sorry about that. And with the balancing of materials, uh, changing this path from, from bituminous concrete to stone dust and, and modeling the meadows and, and the, the planted areas, we were able to create a, a balance where the removing this building area allowed for the and then the rest of it running off allowed for the the proposed conditions to meet the existing conditions so that's that's where uh the plans were in in what that were submitted under the comp permit and then mr reardon uh, based his comments on I'll focus on one of the main comments that he he gave. Uh, it was basically the start of his stormwater design basis, which was was to ask that, and I'll go back to the existing conditions. Bear with me. That's there was uh, some lack of detail within in the areas, and uh, based on the site, his site visit, he he observed that there were some depressions that were potentially holding water, and he asked that that existing model reflect what's out there. Uh, so we we updated the surface that we had to to show one foot contours, which which will um, when you see these plants next, we'll show these depressions and those depressions have been modeled. So in the in the interim from receiving the comments to tonight, uh, you don't have these, but I'll I'll just express this that I've I've updated the the modeling to establish new numbers for runoff in the existing and then compared the proposed runoff numbers again, and um, to make sure that we're still meeting or, or reducing the existing conditions um, runoff and volume. And we also, he had also asked to take a look at some of the sidelines in terms of, you can see that the topo stops right at the property line. So we've, we've gotten more information and we've added that to it to show where, if any water comes or goes across these sidelines, um, where that is happening add it to the model and then again, compare it to the, you'll see the same underneath here and, and add it to, to this plan to make sure that we're mimicking um, the existing conditions as best we can. We will be adjusting some of the grading in the rear here to make sure that the high points of, of where certain uh, areas of water go one way or the other, that that will match. Um, so I'm confident to be able to say that when you when we when we resubmit everything, the stormwater wise, we'll be able to address uh, that particular comment, which um, I'll say in my in my interpretation of his comments, there's a lot of other comments that are associated with that. So from being able to get to that point, I'm, I feel as though I'll be able to uh, address the majority of the remaining stormwater comments as well. And I, I know we're not going to talk about constructability, but I will say so much, but I will say that one of the comments that I will uh, certainly provide data for is when this infiltration system is installed. Um, criteria for what will be needed to be done for it during construction to allow uh, material to be stored or, or equipment to go over it, uh, whether or not it can or can't, will 
expressly put that in into plans and, and into documentation so um it's clear as to the area that the, the majorities will have in terms of using it for constructability um and that i think we've we've already talked about well we're working on that and we'll we'll get there and we'll have a, a robust plan to, to show you and and what i heard tonight from mr ridden as well and something we'll address is is interim erosion control during construction for both ground cover and other mitigation measures um as you saw from these plans we we pretty much jump from existing to proposed so his his comments is not wasted and, and and is very much heard that we need an interim plan to make sure that this site stays stable and is um adequately controlled for erosion and, and runoff um, without getting into the the minute details of, of his comments i think that's probably enough for everyone to be on the same page happy to answer any questions or if there's anything that um i went too fast over happy to go through it some more so with that mr chair i'll turn it over to you and i'll pull the plans up if we need to or do you want me to leave them up um no that's fine as it is thank you mr novak i appreciate thank you. that um go back to mr reard and ask him if he has additional comments uh, no, I I think he can't he captured all the things I was thinking of. I you know, just don't want to. Um, you know, it's pretty important comments, so th there's going to be some dialogue about the sufficiency of the information that that gets sent back. If you can envision, you know, there there's two holes, for lack of a better word, in the back of the site, and, and they essentially act like detention ponds. So you know how they work, where they discharge, how they're shaped, um, how deep they are, is going to be pretty important into into determining how much under pre-development conditions, how much stormwater leaves the site. And since everything that leaves this site flows over the parking lot of, of the condominium next door, you know, it's going to be really important to sort of get a handle on, you know, what currently happens and what's proposed to happen under future conditions so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page as to what's going to be happening as far as changes. But I, yeah, I, I think we're, we're on our way. I think we we understand what we're or the applicant understands what we're looking for and we're hoping to get it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Reardon. Um, Ms. Chapnick, I know you had alluded earlier, you had a stormwater question as well. Thank you, Chairman Klein. Um at first I had a question. Um the the application shows that the NOAA for Atlas NOAA Atlas 14 um data set was used for the stormwater calculations. Um, but it, it didn't specify which um, NOAA Atlas 14 data. Um, the Conservation Commission has been requesting, this, is, this has been our, our current practice, um, and we are currently updating our regs, but this is consistent with what we've been asking over the last year or two for permits. We've been asking applicants to use the NOAA 14 plus um, data sets for precipitation that is 0 0.9 times the upper confidence level of the range. Um, is that something that you think is it, you could uh, use for calculation or have you? Um, Mr. Novak, do you know which model set you're using? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I believe that's where we're at, but I will make, sh I will make sure that we, we are at those particular sets of, of rain events. That that should not be a problem, because I, I know when we went through with the informal conservations, we've looked at a couple different data sets, and that was certainly one of them. And I believe that's where we stayed, but I will make sure on the next filing that that is clear and concise. Thank you. And then if I may, I have just one more comment. Um, considering that the site is tight, as people have said, and erosion control is very important, as, as Mr. Reardon has maintained, um, I, I would recommend, I know we're, we're early for, for thinking of conditions, um, but I would recommend an independent environmental monitor during construction. It's very important that we don't have sedimentation um, and surface water flow um, into our resource areas off the site, um, especially in Riverfront. Um, so that's a recommendation from the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chapnick. Um, I would also note that the using the NOAA 14 plus data sets, um, that is also a practice that the zoning board has um, included in both of the uh, 40B applications that came before the board in the last two years. So. Um, we would really be, be looking for that set of data uh, for this project as well. Mr. Chair, if I could just add one quick thing. 
Yes, sir. Um, so, so I understand. I, I understand the desire to use all the NOAA data and all the 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 more sort of the higher storm events. The, the only awkward thing is the stormwater standards specifically require the old numbers. Yeah. So what I'd ask is, Michael, if you could just document those two, th then we can just check the box saying that we meet those standards. Uh, Mr. Chair, my yes, uh, I can. Please, I'll give you. I'll give you both, so we can we can all check our own boxes. Sure. <laughs> Um, if I may just make uh, one quick comment with regard to that area, uh, Mr. Yeah. Reardon had mentioned in a, some email, email correspondence, I'm not sure I see it in the in the comment letter, but maybe I'm missing it as I scroll through right now, but um, there was a comment that the walking path uh, that we're proposing um, portion of that would we would fall within the first um, 100 feet of the riverfront area, small portion of it, so we'd be willing to reconfigure that walkway. Um, there was a recommendation from the architectural uh, review a team that that the stone dust uh, might um, want to become something else, possibly impervious. Um, and so we're um, trying to figure out what we're doing there, but we're certainly happy either way to uh, remove it, you know, to relocate it, reconvert so it's out of that first time feed. Right, thank you. Um, in the, the comment letter that we received uh, from the <clears throat> town engineer, um, had a stormwater section. Most of the comments uh, deal specifically with calculations and are just looking for um, some numerical data on things. Um, and then he was looking for some additional information about uh, how the collection system works, where the the you know the parts of the infrastructure for the collection system. Um, and then he had a question about um, an observation test hole that was included on the plans. Um, I was wondering if there was any additional data that could be provided uh, indicating the subsurface conditions in the area proposed to be utilized for stormwater infiltration. Um, do you know if that information would, I, I believe looking back that the, that observation test will may not necessarily be related to this project, but I wasn't sure. So if, but just ask um, Mr. Novak if he knows. Yeah, I, I can't say that we, um, we conducted soil testing on site um, and it was done with done through a with a licensed soil evaluator. We did uh, by memory. I can look at the plans, but I think we did three, possibly four holes. Uh, they were pretty consistent in terms of of soil type and depth. I'll make sure that they are um, front and center on any new plans that come through, and make sure that everybody is is comfortable with them. And if we need more information, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll provide it. Thank you very much. Um, and that was essential. That was the essential portion of those of those comments. Um, with that, are there questions or comments from um, members of the Board of Appeals in regards to the stormwater system? There are none. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, we sort of tie these two topics together. Um, so one is, so this is a condominium development. So the intention is that once uh, the project is built and the project is sold, the developers are no longer a part of the um, a, a part of the process anymore, and it turns over to the home ownership association. I was curious how the provisions of the the board's whatever the decision the board reaches. You know, if the board said, you know, we're to go forward with this plan and say, you know, we want to have this wildflower meadow, and then five years down the road, the residents say, no, we really want to just put in regular grass and a play set. Um, how is that maintained where there's no ownership continuation? And I don't know if that that might be a question actually for Mr. Haverty or Mr. Feldman. I'm not quite I can sure. Answer, I can answer that rather easily. Mr. Mashuri, you can. Okay. So, um, First off, uh, we will retain ownership of the retail component. So okay. uh, by definition, we would still have a seat on the board uh, as a commercial unit owner. Um, so we still will be involved, you know, after we convey the, uh, the 50 um, condominium units, residential units. Uh, further, any project like this, uh, we, we write in any special permits, any orders of conditions, um, anything that's granted by um, local and state uh, authorities are written into the bylaws um, and uh, have to be ad adhered to in perpetuity. Okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, on, on, on if I can piggyback on that. Please, Mr. Haverty. Um, so the board can include as part of its decision 
um, a condition that these issues be addressed in the condominium documents. And you can require that the, the board be provided copies of those documents before certificates of occupancy have been issued and you know, for your review for consistency with the decision. Okay. Uh, that was the clarification that I was going to uh, make, Mr. Chair, that uh, Matt's reference to bylaws is really mm -hmm. technically a reference to the master deed of the condominium. And uh, when we prepare these condominium documents that we do quite regularly, um, the master deed is going to be subject to, and the ownership of all of these units are going to be subject to the uh, permits and approvals that are obtained in order for the project to be built. Mm -hmm. So if there are ongoing obligations, we, we call them out in the master deed. So there's no confusion as to the obligation of the trustees of the condominium association to undertake and perform the uh, uh, requirements, the operation and maintenance requirements you were uh, addressing. Thank you. And, and as well as any changes to the plants. Yeah. Um, they'd have to come back. Uh, the, the, if the condo association, for example, wanted to change the meadow to a to uh, grass, they just couldn't do that unilaterally. They they're doing work within the jurisdiction of the CONICOM. They'd have to file a notice of intent under the Wetlands Protection Act, and they would have to file an amendment of the comp permit. Um, right. So that they don't have that unilateral authority to change what you guys have approved. Okay. And then um, for the stormwater infiltration system, is there a um, sort of a maintenance protocol that the building owners would, would need to follow that goes forward as well? I don't know if it's Mr. Novak, maybe. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll start with that. And if there's anything else that needs, um, as part of the stormwater report and and um, presentation, there is an operation and maintenance portion of that that has uh, a during construction and a post construction, and they're usually set up to be under the contractor during the during construction, and then they transfer to the you know owner of the property, as Mr. Palm was saying, probably the the HOA and, and part of the master deed. So yes, there is, and it's it's for any piece of stormwater that's proposed on the site, and in particular, the infiltration system as well. Great. And if I could add, add to that, Mr. Chair, so the, the, fortunate thing, the fortunate thing about this infiltration system is, is it serves exclusively roof runoff. So it's not going to be, you know, subject to the same level of sedimentation and trash and contamination that it would be if it had served pavement. So I, I think you know, will still want to see an O&M plan, but in terms of the board's concern for its viability, you, you can you can rest assured it's going to function for a long time. Okay. And <clears throat> lastly, is there any um, observations about what the, the current flow condition is from this site across that parking lot? Um, I wasn't I know that you know the the plan is to you know not increase the flow across that parking lot, but I was curious as to what sort of the current condition of that flow is. I don't know if that is something that maybe came up when um, Matt when you were discussing the possibility of doing mitigation at the riverfront. If that was something that the condo association brought up, anything about um, the existing flow of water across that parking area. Um, there was no discussions uh, between us and, and the board, and um, I'll let Mike comment relative to the uh, pre and post. Yeah, so um, thank you, Matt. Uh, Mr. Chair, the the runoff, uh, I'll make sure that the, it's very clear as to what's going on in terms of the runoff to that parking lot. Um, in terms of the numbers, uh, the, the goal is to reduce, but until I know I'm reducing, I'm going to say um, at least meeting. Uh, and yep. until it, but the uh, the other thing to look at too is there's two existing parking areas out there now that are going to be removed, and um, you know the the rest of the runoff within the within 100 feet of it is all going to be that that replanted area in the meadow. So the the contamination that could be gone through there is is pretty much removed, and then you also have about 100 to plus feet of natural. Um, area to remove any sediment and, and anything like that because the just to for everybody to be on the same page the parking area for this building is internal um and we'll have a grease trap and internal collection and so none of that water will be being discharged either so the state of it now i'm i'm, I'm not really i don't have a lot of information on but i can certainly say that i think we're making some improvements to it 
Okay. And Mr. Chair, if I could yeah. just sort of. Yes, please. Um, try to sort of articulate my concern. So, so right now it's, it's hard to figure out how water leaves the existing site and crosses the, the parking lot. Usually you'd see staining or some evidence of it. And yeah, I was looking through and I, I couldn't figure out visually where water was cutting across the sidewalk, but you, you know, it does at some point. Um, my principal concern is th there's no infrastructure. Or it doesn't look like there's any collection infrastructure on that parking lot. So really anything coming from this site is just going to sheet across their parking lot and end up in the, in Millbrook. And what I'm most concerned about is, you know, are we adequately understanding how sort of that discharge changes? And are we, we want to just be careful we're not creating like an icing condition or some unsafe condition on that parking lot by virtue of how we've sort of, you know, changed, although in a small way, it, it, it could be substantive. So I just want to make sure that we try to give some definition to that. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? I do not see any. So we've had presentations from the applicant and the board's uh, consultants about issues involving uh, wetland areas of the site and uh, stormwater and how that will be mitigated on site. So um, are there is there anything further from either the the applicant or the uh, the board's consultants on those two topics? I have one related issue that I just want okay. to make sure we, we keep in mind is um so some of the, the slopes on the walkways and the grading don't appear to meet accessible um, slope requirements. So what we want to do is just make sure that if 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 something needs to be, I'm not really that familiar with accessibility laws as it relates to the architecture, but if something needs to be accessible, we're going to have to demonstrate that it meets those grading requirements. Very good. Thank you. All right. With that, <clears throat> um, so uh, so tonight's hearing will will shortly be open for public comment. Um, but before we do, I want to review some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. So public questions and comments are taken only as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Due to previously demonstrated interest in the project and to provide for an orderly flow to the meeting, the chair directs individual public speakers to try to limit their comments to four to five minutes and to use their time to provide comment related solely to the topics discussed at tonight's hearing. Um, there are other nights that we will be discussing other topics. So I really would like to, uh, while we have the benefit of having our, um, <clears throat> excuse me, our, uh, our stormwater consultant and our wetlands consultants present, I do want to try to limit the questions to those topics to best use their time. Um, the, uh, so please note there are multiple hearings scheduled and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comment. The chair encourages the public to provide written comments to be reviewed by the board and included in the record. Um, the chair will first ask members of the public who have previously identified themselves by logging in through Zoom who wish to speak to digitally raise their hand using the raised hand button in the participants tab of the Zoom application. Uh, you'll be called upon by the chair and you may unmute yourself and you'll be asked to give your name and address for the record. And then you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly and concisely and in a way that will help us generate an accurate record of the meeting. Those calling in by phone, you may dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. When called upon, you may unmute your line. Please identify yourself by name and address for the record and you'll be given up to four minutes for questions and comments. Uh, excuse me, five minutes. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly, concisely, and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. And once all public questions or comments have been addressed, or we have reached the hour of 10 o'clock, uh, the public comment period for this evening's hearing will be closed. And as previously noted, there are multiple hearings scheduled for this project, and each hearing will have an opportunity for public comments. And the board and the applicant and the staff will do our best to show documents being discussed. And if you'd like to ask for a specific document to be displayed during your comments, please ask us to do so. Uh, so with that, uh, one second here to jot down the names in order. Um, 
Okay, with that, uh, the first name is Susan Stamps. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I appreciated all of the discussion. I pre appreciated- um, I'm afraid I have to ask you for your address. And oh, then... I'm so sorry. Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street. I am on the tree committee, but speaking as an individual. I appreciated um, uh, the Conservation Commission chair's um, uh, uh, complementing the pollinator gardens that are um, being proposed. I am concerned about um, stormwater flooding there along the Bill, Mill Brook. I think that's, uh, if you look at, um, I just looked at Google Maps satellite view at the tree canopy cover along Mass Ave all the way from the Cambridge line up to Trader Joe's and the, the tree canopy right there at 1025 Mass Ave is the largest along Mass Ave and Arlington. And the idea of taking down all those trees um, right along Mill Brook seems like not a good idea. Um, those, those tree roots are picking up a lot of water um, in heavy rains. And I think there's been discussion of Mill Brook um, could possibly overflow if there are extreme rains, which you know there will be. And it just seems like a bad idea to take, certainly to take all the trees down. So I would like more discussion about that. Also, I know that over the years, there's been discussion of a Millbrook Linear Park. Um, and I'm wondering if the ZBA has the inclination or the ability to ask for a public easement along Millbrook on that property, and which could tie into the wonderful Linear Park that they have constructed more to the east towards Grove Street. And um, let's see, I also, um, on the stormwater issue, and this is my last comment, um, any surfaces that could be made permeable and pervious, um, I would like there to be an emphasis on that, especially as you get closer to the brook, but really anywhere on the property. And those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker uh, is uh, Zavid Pritzer. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Zavid Pretzer. I live at 44 Grove Street in Arlington. Um, so as someone who's you know basically on the same block as this project, I just want to thank everyone for their very informative presentations. I think this is an excellent project, and I hope that everyone's able to work together to make it successful. Uh, in particular, I'm really happy with the idea of um, replacing the Norway maples with plantings that will provide more, more habitat value over the long term um, with a pollinator garden and other plantings. I think that's great. Um, as a local resident, I've seen firsthand how Millbrook does currently flood and how that can threaten uh, local buildings. Um, and so I do think anything that can be done to not just maintain but improve the stormwater management on this property will be very valuable to both both to the town and to local residents. And so I think that should be definitely valued through this process. I mean, I think um, I'm glad that the uh, applicants taking stormwater management seriously. And I think you know any benefits that can be provided there are just very valuable, but I think this is a great location for additional housing and additional affordable housing. And so I definitely support this project and I hope that it, that it is successful. Um, and I'm glad that a lot of the impacts of this project are being taken very seriously. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is Annie LaCourt. Um, yes, Annie LaCourt, 48 Chatham Street in Arlington. Um, I would like to uh, echo um, Zavid's comments, but also maybe add a few of my own. I think that when you're considering a project like this, um, we need to be considering um, a, a forward-looking perspective, not what does the neighborhood look like now, not what's going on now, but what is the condition of the neighborhood and um, the lot going to be uh, 30 years from now. And this is an opportunity to replace um, invasive species, and a, a badly working um, environment with 
the kind of plantings and the kind of uh, forward-looking um, environmental effects that uh, are badly needed in these kinds of locations. Um, as anybody who has a Norway maple overshadowing their backyard like I do knows, Norway maples literally create deserts beneath themselves. They suck up all the water and almost nothing grows there. So the idea that somehow we could retain the Norway maples and plant natives and expect those natives to thrive is a little bit of a contradiction. Um, I'm very excited about um, how much the um, uh, developer is taking seriously these environmental effects. Um, and my only uh, regret is that we can't somehow get the Millbrook Condo Association to turn that driveway into something permeable uh, to help with the uh, runoff um, from the project. Um, so at least from the perspective of um, Millbrook and environmental effects and so on and so forth, I'm very pleased with uh, what was presented tonight. And um, I hope that these will not be the things that stand in the way of approving the project. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, uh, Patricia Warden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Patricia Warden, 27 Jason Street. Um, thank you. I thank you. I like to say that I would really, really appreciate Mr. Moore's um, comments and those who wish to preserve the tree canopy. Um, the clear cutting of large mature trees would, would cause climate damage, and the area would probably become a heat island, which is a public health concern. Um, I uh, do think that um, the, the um, nearby Wellington Park is a good example of what we need in that uh, linear park designated area, which, um, as uh, Ms. Stamps uh, mentioned, uh, would benefit from a public easement there. Easement there. Um, and I think that, um, th that the biggest hazard to this whole project is its effect on climate change. And my comments on that, I would like to keep for another day, but I, I do think that um, the humanitarian crisis that arise from the, the um, climate change do demand that we take much more care of our trees. I would like to mention that I have several very large um, maples in my, no, Norway maples in my backyard. And where we go to sit in summer is underneath the largest of them, which is always 10 degrees lower than the rest of the yard. So uh, they do have tremendous benefits and I uh, hate to see a heat island created there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Warden. Um, next on the list um, is Steve Moore. Uh, yes, Steve Moore, uh, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, I certainly appreciate uh, everyone's interest in, in trees and trying to do this right. I understand uh, Ms. LaCour's approach of uh, having kind of a longer term perspective rather than immediate. Um, the only issue is that a manufactured urban forest um, needs care to survive. And all you have to do is look around a lot of the housing developments in Arlington to see forests just die when they're not cared for. And sadly, although the best planning and work can go into making an urban forest that, that could thrive, it but is not maintained, the forest doesn't necessarily survive. Clearly this one, which is not a great forest, I'm not pushing that idea, uh, has naturally established itself and is very is surviving actually very well. It may not be the best use of the land, I agree. So more, more discussion here, that's all. I mean, I, I think there are a number of perspectives. It sounds like they're being taken into account and that's, I think that's a good thing. There'll be a good compromise at the end. Um, but one, um, one more technical question. Um, it looks looked to me when I did walk the site that a lot of the back area where the woods are seems to be kind of a rocky broken up ledge area. And I know that a lot of that area is where they intend to sink the uh, water retention pond, so to speak. 
and I, I appreciate the comment in Mr. Reardon's report about not wanting to compact the soil beneath where those uh, structures are going to be so they can absorb the water. What, what happens if you drill down and find you hit ledge or whatever, where does the water in those particular manufactured retention areas go after it gets filled up? And this is, I'm, I'm showing my ignorance as much as anything else. Is there someone that might be able to answer that question for me, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, Mr. Moore, if you could, um, it, would you have a follow-up depending on that answer or? No, thank no. you. Thank you. Um, I would uh, like to ask Mr. Novak if he's, um, Still available. If he could just address the question, because I know that they have done some test pits and some explorations of the subsoil condition. So I think it's sort of a two-part question. One is, um, you know, are, do we have confidence that it's not ledge underneath? And then, um, how do we? What happens if you know the water doesn't move the way that we anticipate it's going to move? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to try to address all of that. Uh, we, we did conduct soil testing on site. Uh, we went down 80 plus inches below what's an existing grade now. And we, um, I'm just going to look at the plan so I don't misspeak while I speak to you. Uh, and we found a, a loomy sand uh, type of material, no evidence of ledge uh, down those 80 plus inches. Um, so, so we're sitting in, at elevations of, of 76 and, and so on, and we didn't find any uh, groundwater either, so no evidence that there was any anything restrictive or anything happening below that. Um, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, did did you do additional borings out there as well, or we that, did. Yeah, and was there any ledge encountered there either? Um, we hit uh, a ver, we hit ledge in um, one of the test borings further up toward Mass Ave. Yeah, uh, I forget exactly where it was, but it we would it was within. Uh, we we were um, we were conducting geotechnical studies to determine what we needed for uh, foundation bearing, um, and we did encounter a ledge. I think down around fourteen or fifteen feet in one of the test borings for um, the the building perimeter. Right, um, that 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 was my recollection, but I wanted I knew you'd have a better handle on it. Um, so or, so in or, that sense, uh, I can say. It was refusal. It could have been, you know, a large right, egg. Right, right. I don't know if it was bedrock, but it was refusal. Right. But, but it, between those, my testing and, and those geotechnical um, borings, we know that we have at least at least eighty inches, if not fourteen feet, of of naturally occurring material before we have to worry about any ledge. So I don't anticipate in the rear of that site encountering any ledge that would hinder the the implementation of that infiltration system, and. Looking at the overall hydrology of the, of the site and the site next to it, where the water is going to go is is to the brook. Um, I mean, that's where it wants to go. That's that's essentially the lowest point where the water moves. So uh, I can't say that we won't find it, and we'll certainly um, once we ex explore and, and excavate. If there is an issue, we'll we'll have to pivot and, and figure something else out. But it's not anticipated, and I'm uh, I hope that helps at least answer some of your your concerns and questions. Right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. if I could just add a couple things maybe to help a little bit. Um, Steve, the stormwater standards, the Massachusetts stormwater standards have whole hundreds of pages on how you analyze um, infiltration to make sure that A, you have enough offset to groundwater, B, that you've adequately monitored your soils according to soil type. So th th there's robust technical guidance on that. And, and to Mike's point, the water that infiltrates in the ground goes right into the groundwater table, which in turn feeds the, the stream. The important thing is by infiltrating it, you get a whole lot of treatment that doesn't happen if it just runs over the surface. So um, we should be well protected there. Thank you so much. Uh, next is uh, Anson Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anson Stewart, Moulton Road in Arlington. Uh, just want to reiterate, as I have in the past, my my overall support for this. I think it's a good development for the town. Uh, one specific question is, what is the condition, the kind of edge condition between the back of this lot and the Millbrook parking lot? Is that current? What What's the slope of that currently? And what is proposed? Any sort of retaining wall or anything like that? Uh, apologies if I missed this, but I think it would help to see uh, some plans that have the contour lines extending uh, through the Millbrook condo parking lot to the brook just to be able to see 
uh, some of the things we've been talking about on that plan. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, I don't know, Matt, if you're Matt Measure, if you could address that question. So what what is the existing condition where the lot meets the parking behind and what is the proposal? I think I'll let Mike um, jump on that if he, he has the plan handy, if that's OK. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I can still share so I can. Um, you should be able to. Yes. Yes. So uh, one second. Sorry, I thought that was a little more ready to go. So the the exist whoops sorry the existing um, and I believe the question was the intersection of this property with the Millbrook uh, parking. What what does right. that cu currently look like, and what is the plan for that to continue to look like? So you can see that the property line here is in dark black, um, and then there's an edge of pavement which is the the parking area. It's a it's a little tough to see, but it, it almost looks like a double line just beyond that. So in between the the so that's the edge of pavement. That's the parking area that we think of in terms of impervious area. Uh, there's just naturally occurring material uh, between that and the and the rest of the site. It uh, it has a shallower slope, um, and and I can certainly uh, as part of addressing Mr. Reardon's comments, we, we're adding some to topography information. I can certainly extend it through uh, the Millbrook development, but that just having walked it is is relatively shallow and flat. Um, it's it's not steep slope, so. Uh, this this site basically, as as Mr. Reardon and I have talked about, bellies out into some some lower depressions, and then um, has a slight berm, and then and then just gradually ends into the the parking area. And and again, it's it's very shallow, so there's not a lot of um, fast moving water across there, which is I think why Mr. Reardon's concerned about some icing uh, potential. We want to make sure that we don't have any worries across that parking lot. But um, the intent moving forward is to is to mimic that. Is, is to not change that at all to keep it a natural uh, natural material up to that up to the property line since we obviously can't do anything beyond our property line um, and, and just make sure that there's there's no major changes in, in terms of how those are those are connected right now okay. and then once it's once you get to the property line are you my understanding is you're are you raising the the rear yard at that point at at the back property line, no, we'll we'll be tying into existing grade. Okay. Yeah, we we don't want to raise or berm or hold anything unless we absolutely have to. But the early indications of the drainage design is that we won't have to retain any water there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> with that, um, I just wanted to just quickly follow up. Um, Mrs. Warden, you have your hand still up. I wasn't sure if you had a further comment or if I should go ahead and lower it. Sorry, can I say something? Since I didn't really have my hand up, but I would like to make one additional comment. One additional that, comment, certainly. Um, I just want to say that this site currently has wonderful natural drainage, water drainage in its, in its um, orientation and slope. And I think it's very tragic to risk um, the, the situation with the current um, means of a retaining wall of um, unspecified quality and strength. So I think that retaining wall really needs to be looked at very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I wanted to return a little bit to uh, what I think may have been part of Mr. Stewart's uh, question, but it's something that I had earlier. Um, and that is that when you look at the drawing that we just looked at, there's there's it, it almost used to be like the 19th century map showing large portions of the world terra incognita. And at the same time, we're told that one of the potential advantages of all of, the, of this pr project will be if the applicant succeeds in working out an appropriate arrange, arrangement with the uh, uh, with the uh, condo association that other things near matters near the stream will greatly improve the uh, environment there. And based on the, that, all is in the terra, terra incognita part, and so you can't really see what what that 
amounts to. And, and eventually, I think we're going to need to see both what's there now and have a better understanding of that area that's between the back property line uh, and the uh, and and the creek. And I uh, hope that the the applicant. I, I assume actually that the applicant, without my saying anything, would do something like that. But it would certainly be very helpful to the board in understanding what's proposed and the advantages of it, and if there are any the disadvantages of it. If we had uh, if we had that map filled in a little bit. Yeah, I, I could just speak, Mr. Hanlon, that um, you know until we got the positive indication from the condo association very recently that they're going to let us even go on to their property. We, we, we haven't in, invested in, you know, the mitigation design that Rich Kirby uh, intends to do for that area between the cur the edge of Creek and the edge of parking that's on uh, the Millbrook um, condo property. But you're right. We are going to have a plan that is going to be developed to show the mitigation that's going to be undertaken in that area um, that will be specified. Um, so you'll, we'll, we'll get that submitted now that we know uh, our ability to be able to execute on some performance in that area uh, looks like it's becoming a reality. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Feldman. Um, <clears throat> so I just want to return it. Are there any other members of the public who wish to address the zoning board this evening on topics related to uh, wetlands or stormwater in relation to this project? I see no hands up. I just wanted to quickly make sure I wasn't missing anyone. I do not see any other hands up at this time. So with that in mind, I will go ahead and close the public comment period uh, for this hearing. And I'd like to, to especially thank all of you who have uh, contributed this evening for your participation. Uh, it is very, very helpful and very necessary, and we appreciate it. Um, are there any additional questions from the board uh, for the the applicant or any of the consultants? Did not see any. Um, are there any? So I, I there were certainly a, a lot of takeaways. I think that we discussed uh, throughout the hearing, and um, there's a lot of documentation that the applicant is looking to to add and include um, in projects going in the project set going forward. So uh, the board looks forward to um, reviewing that information when it becomes available. Um, looking forward to the next hearing. So uh, the next hearing on this uh, on this uh, site will be uh, Thursday, January 26th, which is two weeks from tonight. Um, and we had preliminarily talked about um, having traffic and related topics uh, as the topic of discussion for that evening. I just wanted to touch base with uh, with Matt Majuri and with uh, Sean Reardon just to make sure that they're both uh, comfortable with that. Or um, an alternative would be we could talk um, architectural issues uh, yeah. with Cliff Bomer instead. I think that, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, I think we should be able to cover traffic um, as well as probably the balance of, um, of Mr. Reardon's civil comments uh, with regard to um, constructability and emergency access. Uh, and we may, I'm not sure that will, would eat up a whole meeting. So um, there's a possibility that we could um, at least begin some initial conversations on, on architectural as well, if okay. uh, time allowed. And Mr. Chair, I, I... It's looking like I'm going to have a conflict that evening. I, I can oh. send our traffic folks to certainly cover the traffic issues. I, I don't think any of those are are terribly involved. Um, and I, I, I don't have a problem sort of working directly with the applicant to address all the comments that we've listed to date and then come back with something maybe okay. after the architectural gets discussed. Uh, we, we could if it if it we would also be flexible if mm -hmm. we wanted to move my suggestions to the subsequent meeting and focus on architectural at the next meeting. Okay. Uh, I think we'd have that flexibility if it was more productive for Mr. Rear to be uh, present for the balance of the civil and traffic review. Yeah, one thing though, Matt, we have to confirm with Vanessa that uh, our consultants, I, we know our consultant is available for the 26th. We, we have to double check availability after that. And if Mr. Reardon could have his traffic people from Tetra Tech um, 
it still may be worthwhile because I think, you know, traffic tends to be a, a public centric concern. And I think we'd like to get some feedback from the public or uh, as to um, if um, they're satisfied. We think the assessment report indicates very little impact, but we'd, we'd really like to get some public so, feedback. On that. So perhaps I can suggest we do traffic and then jump into architectural and then we would save um, constructability and fire access for the subsequent meeting. Yeah, when Mr. Reardon is there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Can I just ask you a, a question? The, as I read the reports, one of the major issues that come up having to do with traffic has to do with, is also closely related with constructability issues. Mm -hmm. uh, since a lot of it, I mean, a lot of the comments have concerned what happens with the traffic on Massachusetts Avenue when and if some parts of Massachusetts Avenue are occupied by construction vehicles. And that I'm sure that whole kind of issue will be dealt with in the construction plan. Um, and I'm just wondering how it is that, I mean, it, it, I'm just wondering about separating, separating those two off into, into separate meetings, but it, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out a way of, of being able to have a hearing on traffic that actually deals with all of the traffic issues. And it's a little hard to see how that will work. Mm -hmm. If I could respond to that, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, so there are there are a, a host of other traffic related issues, which is like capacity and, and safety and things like that, that I think it would be a good idea to to cover. Um, I, I think the access issues and the, the safety issues related to traffic are are just as much a civil issue as as much a traffic issue. Usually when we think of traffic, we think more of intersection analysis, pedestrian safety and things like that. So there are sort of there's not a whole lot of really, really big, hairy issues for this project, largely because it's such a small percentage of the background traffic. So um, just I, I think there is a, there's enough there to cover sort of just to, to like to Paul's point to hear the, the neighborhood, see what they have to say about traffic related issues, as well as to cover those sort of, you know, traditional traffic planning type discussion items. Okay. So yeah, because I know there, there's definitely going to need to be a much larger discussion about constructability um, and sort of what the what the impacts are not not only to Mass Ave, but impacts to uh, to abutting properties, and you know how we're going to make all this work on such a small site. So that in a lot of ways that um, I think it's going to get can get tied up with a lot of the other civil issues, um, and then for so. Let's plan for two weeks from now. We'll deal with, we'll start with traffic. Um, and I will see um, if I, uh, I'll talk to the traffic advisory, the transportation advisory committee to see if they can um, have a member present for that meeting. Um, and then we can, from there, we can move on and talk about um, some of the architectural uh, and uh, issues that have been, uh, been brought up in the, through the investigation of our consultant um, and working with the applicant. Um, so I think between those two topics, I think we should have a full plate for the 26th. Agreed. Are there any other um, issues that we should address in terms of either planning or um, logistics? Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, one of the things that Ms. Chapnick and some others have asked for, and that I think that either Mr. Feldman or Mr. Majority has warned us is not likely to fall on sympathetic ears, has to do with public access. From my point of view, I understand the liability issues, and and I've, I've actually sat on condo boards where we've dealt with the same thing, so I get how that works. Um, but I'm, but it, at least sometimes there's there are provisions. My understanding is for public access, and I'd like to sort of see if there are examples of places where that was done, and if it was done, how the usual obstacles are done, so that we don't we don't reject that option or or uh, combine with rejecting that option 
uh, without having taken taken a look at a better look at the possibilities than we have in the record now. Where would we? Where do you think, Mr. Hamlin, we would look for examples of such a thing? I th I would I would assume that we're looking largely at forty B things, and I'm certain mm -hmm. that with the experience both of the applicant and the applicant's lawyers and the applicant's consultants that they would be if there are things that are like that that are out there with a reasonable search uh, that they would be able to uh, identify them okay thank you um and Ms. chapnick thank you chairman klein um i just wanted to ask if the applicant knew or rich kirby knew when we were going to get the updated plans for um the mitigation areas as were discussed, um, just in terms of uh, scheduling for review from the Conservation Commission. Thank you. So what we'd, what we'd like to do, Ms. Ms. Chatnick, and I don't know to what extent you've already been engaged by town council or um, uh, the board chair, is Mr. Reardon has suggested, and we agree with him, that being able to commence uh, the NOI review under the Wetlands Protection Act while the comp permit proceeding is going forward has a lot of advantages because it gives the Conservation Commission, you know, independent jurisdiction to fashion an order of conditions, which then can be um, uh, aid the zoning board in the comp permit process. And we've already committed that we would extend whatever statutory time periods there are for the Conservation Commission to act on a notice of uh, intent under the Wetlands Protection Act so that um, the decision on that would uh, occur after the comp permit process was over. And so we've already asked Mr. Kirby to start um, um, thinking about an NOI filing that has been updated um, to include the um, urban park that um, you saw a little bit about tonight, but also now that uh, access to Mill Brook is more likely what that mitigation is going to look like. And, and I think that if we can get some word from the Conservation Commission that it's open to receiving an NOI application, uh, we would get that in to you um, within the next two or three weeks um, so that um, you know, by the time we get past January 26th and we're on to another hearing, you will have had an opportunity to start looking at that. Um, uh, as as um, as the uh, CONCOM chair knows, um, we actually filed the notice of intent for this project early on in order to get ahead of this issue. Um, and as was pointed out to us, the preference was that They'd rather consider an NOI at least after a comp permit application has been filed. And frankly, the conservation could say, you know, until a comp permit is issued. But it would, it's important to the applicant, and we think to this process, that there's some concurrent um, um, review going on because we think it will help coordinate Wetland Protection Act issues and local bylaw issues so that everything conforms. Mr. Chairman, may I respond? Please. Thank yes, you. Please. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that, Mr. Feldman. Um, we we actually in Arlington coordinate extremely well, the CONCOM and the ZBA. Um, so in the past, we have integrated um, the bylaw um, conditions and the Wetland Protection Act um, and assisted assisted the ZBA with that to make sure that if the project is approved, the conditions in the wetland areas are consistent between the comprehensive permit and the permit under the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, we're, we're open to doing it this way though as well, um, receiving an NOI from, from, the, um, from the applicant, from you. Um, I will say that we will not close our hearing um, likely, uh, the you know, the commission has to vote, but it's likely that the commission will not vote to close the hearing before the ZBA has completed their work, um, because we do want to make sure the conditions are consistent 
Um, as you know, under the Wetlands Protection Act, we'll just be really looking at riverfront and the uh, aura, the adjacent upland resource area, which is a resource area in the town of Arlington, is not gonna be reviewed under the Conservation Commission NOI process. However, it is under the ZBA. And that's that's why we wait, because we wanna make sure everything is, is consistent. Um, just to give you an example of what we've done in the past, even um, when the NOI waited till after um, the ZBA had completed their work. It only took an extra month in the Conservation Commission to complete the NOI under the WPA because we do do that coordination so well. That said, it's really up to you. You're the applicant. And if you'd like to, you know, to submit the NOI now, the Conservation Commission will open the hearing. Um, we do appreciate that um, you're saying you're willing to um, to allow continuances because likely the commission would request that additional information and coordination with the ZBA. Yeah, we appreciate that, Ms. Chapman. Mm -hmm. and we would like to proceed on that basis. Um, you know, every project is different. We have mm -hmm. contractual obligations with our sellers to mm -hmm. achieve uh, uh, entitlements if we're going to get them by a certain time period. It's a very expensive process to the applicant. So while a month doesn't sound like a long time, a month can make a big difference in terms of our permitting period under our contracts, mm -hmm. and a month can make another substantial difference in in, in thousands of dollars of uh, of costs. So, um, yes, we will. We completely understand you'll keep the public mm -hmm. hearing open. We completely understand no decision will be issued under the Wetlands Protection Act until the CompCom permit process is completed. But uh, we will, and we appreciate. We greatly appreciate your flexibility in allowing us to get a notice of intent in. We will do that. And as I said, I think Rich said that he's already been working on it, but he said he would put together a new, more uh, complete filing up to date. And we'll talk to him about addressing the Millbrook uh, piece um, and get that NOI application into you, uh, I think, you know, for early February. Okay. Thank you very much for that heads up. And Rich understands that the, the updated information that is going to come into the NOI under the Wetlands Protection Act to the CONCOM should also then be updated for the comprehensive permit because they're, they're permitting it under our bylaw, which also requires that information. 100%. In fact, Great. What, we, what we need to do is we need to take the old NOI and update it with our comp permit filing to date. So yep. first we have to update it the other way. And then we have to, uh, in response to what we're hearing tonight, get the mitigation plan for the Millbrook area developed and detailed for both the CONCOM and the ZBA. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Um, so I think that is everything we had hoped to achieve this evening. Um, Mr. Haverty, is there anything else you think we should cover tonight, or I think we are good to continue? I think we're good to continue, Mr. Chairman. Very good. Well, with that, then I will move to continue the public hearing on the comprehensive permit for the residences at Millbrook, which is 1021-1025 Massachusetts Avenue, until 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, January 26th, 2023. Second. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. So this is a vote of the board to continue uh, this public hearing till uh, two weeks from tonight at 7.30. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on um, the residence is at Millbrook. And I'd like to thank everyone for their um, for everything they provided to this tonight's meeting and for all their comments and uh, expertise. It's really very much appreciated. Um, so thank you one and all for that. And thanks to you all for a very productive meeting and we appreciate everybody's time. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So the, just for the board's sake, um, so just to review our calendar as we do at the end of our meetings. Um, so our next meeting will be the 
uh, Thursday, January 24th, um, which is the, uh, excuse, no, will be Tuesday, January 24th, sorry. We have two meetings that week, uh, the 24th, which will be 189 Forest Street, which has been distributed to the board, um, and which is a large edition. And then um, I would also like to spend some time uh, reviewing uh, the proposed zoning articles that are coming before the ARB. There's a number of them that sort of impact how uh, we would be looking at things. There's a couple that have to do with usable open space, um, which are interesting. So I just wanted to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about those with the board um, as well on the 24th. And then the next hearing after that is two days later, which is Thursday, January 26th, which as we just said, is the comprehensive permit where we'd be talking about traffic issues and uh, architectural issues. And then after that, um, the next would be Thursday, February 9th, which would again be a continuation of this permit. And then Tuesday, February 14th would be our regular meeting. Um, but if Mr. Valarelli, do you, have you seen anything that would be coming up for the 14th of February? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's a couple of requests in, in, in progress, but nothing definite yet. So no okay. date's been determined. Okay. Thank you. If we can keep Valentine's Day free, I think there would be some appreciative <laughs> people, yeah. but um, you know, yeah. it is what it is. For sure. <laughs> um, and then just to bring the board up to speed, so the Housing Corporation of Arlington is putting together a comprehensive permit application for 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, so they are a nonprofit development agency. They are proposing, uh, it would be 43 affordable rental units um, with availability between 30% and 80% of AMI. Um, and then a small commercial space is a part of that as well. So they made a presentation to the select board on Monday and the select board voted unanimously to send a letter of support for the project to Mass Housing. Um, so that is, once that letter is in at Mass Housing, um, the next step is waiting for a letter of appropriateness from Mass Housing, um, at which point it would authorize the applicants to apply for a comprehensive permit. So, um, I'm not quite sure what the timeline on that's going to be. I'm hoping it's a little bit longer than quick, um, but we'll we'll sort of see where that falls. I'm anticipating it'll probably we're probably looking three four months out before that can get turned around and completed the way that um, things have been going at the state level. But we could get surprised, so I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, and then the sort of the last piece is we have. Um, Obviously, on March 31st is the last date that we're allowed to meet we're fully remote. Um, after that, we're, we have to come back or do something hybrid or the state needs to act. Um, and so we have we had uh, some people come from uh, the from the town to talk to us about hybrid meeting formats. I, I feel unfortunately like it was a long time ago they came and I've kind of been dragging my feet on this issue. Um, but I think we we had expressed at the time that if we were going to do this, we would want to try to do a dry run that was not um, a night where we were actually doing something. Um, and unfortunately, they offered that Thursday nights would be a good opportunity for this because the town offices are open Thursday and they told me just too late. So alas, um, I, I don't want to take up every single Thursday night of your life. So um, I need to try to come up with another option. One question I had for members is would, if we were to try to set aside like an hour, hour and a half on an afternoon, is that something that people could fit into their schedules or like first thing in the morning? Um, this would just be a one-time thing um, that we would be trying to accomplish. Sure, I can do that. Dan, I saw you were shaking your head originally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that that would work for me. I think, uh, uh, you know, I my schedule bounces around a little bit, but typically uh, Tuesdays through Thursdays are much busier. Okay. Um, sometimes on site, so uh, beginning and end of the week are usually easier for me if if it's just a one off. Okay. Um, Elaine, would that work for you too? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sooner the better for me because I'm on leave right yep. now, so I have lots of flexibility. <laughs> All right. Well, given that, let me see if I can try to arrange for a Monday afternoon. 
Um, I would say Friday, except that most of town offices are closed at noon on Friday. So it's just try to arrange this at a time when when town staff are, are still on the clock. So we're not taking up anybody else's personal time. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moore. Uh, having gone through this process already. Um, yes. Um, uh, do you know yet what room you're going to want to use? Has anyone proposed a particular room? Because only so many rooms are set up this way. So I had, they had talked to us initially about uh, the second floor room in the community center, but I've heard that the air conditioning is very loud. Uh, yes. Um, and, then, yeah. and then they mentioned one of the conference rooms at town hall, and I don't remember if it's the second floor or the third floor conference room in the annex, but one of those rooms they had mentioned. Yeah, I would recommend the one in the annex. Uh, it's the best set up and it's got the most, it's the best room. So if you can choose that one. Okay. And definitely have Mr. Feeney or whoever is going to give you instruction, take you all through it because it, it can work quite well. It can also be quite messy and it won't take an hour and a half to do your dry run. It'll you'll realize pre pretty quickly it's not that hard once it gets set. Okay. Part is the setup. And I suggest one of your board be charged with the task of being the technical person. Okay. Uh, not, not you as chairman. <laughs> you're also trying to run the meeting and it just doesn't work trying to do both. Okay. Do you, do you think it would be helpful to have one or two members participating from home just to test that yeah. part of as well? Yeah. Okay. That's what, that's what we did. We had a couple okay. Home. We had a couple in the room, and the room is actually the equipment's great as long as it's set up right. And Rick is getting it. All right. Just my two cents. No, I, I appreciate it. We're we're flying blind into this, so that's greatly appreciated. All right, so I will get back in touch with um with the town and with the committee, and we'll try to get that set up for um a Monday in the near future. Excellent. That is everything I have in my magic packet of papers. So thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. I especially want to thank Rick Ballarelli and Vincent Lee for all their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note that the purpose of the board's recording this meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. And if anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank Second, you, Mr. Hanlon, and thank you, Mr. Dupont. The roll call vote of the board to adjourn for the evening, Mr. Dupont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Ms. Hoffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. The chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. It was a great productive meeting, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys in a couple of weeks. Good night, guys. Good night, all. Take care, everybody. <laughs>